There are many ways to travel across England. One could leisurely travel the inland network of hundreds of miles of old canals aboard a narrowboat, or cycle along one of the many footpaths. One could even travel by car. Or perhaps you could jump aboard one of the many trains that journey to even the smallest of towns. Travelling by rail is very comfortable, easy and relaxing. But there is only one way to do the coast to coast, and that is by walking the 192 miles that stretch from England's village of St. Bees on the Irish Sea in the west to Robin Hood's Bay on the North Sea to the east. It has been described as one of the finest walks in the world, through charming old English villages with quaint pubs and tea rooms, ancient abbeys, Neolithic monuments and medieval ruins. Although thousands of walkers make this trek every year, only the occasional local rambler is seen on the pathways. This walk was devised and described by Alfred Wainwright, a fell walker, guidebook author and illustrator, leading the traveller to walk across three national parks, over the mountains and valleys in the Lake District, through the Yorkshire Dales, and finally crossing the North Yorkshire Moors. The sights and sounds are so magical that only the most diligent of walkers actually manages to make the trek of 192 miles in one trip, as one is so easily distracted by the beauty along the way. Many opt to split the journey into two parts, for this wonderful journey should not be conducted in haste. Cumbria's tiny seaside town of St. Bees on the western coast of northern England is a bustling agricultural village dating from 650 AD, when St. Bega, an abbess, abandoned her convent and sailed from Ireland in the company of other nuns to search for peace and solitude. She found it here in northwest England. The priory and the village of St. Bees, with its multitude of lodgings and pubs to find a meal and a pint, is a delightful setting from where to begin the coast-to-coast -coast walk. St. Bega founded the old priory church, which still stands after suffering numerous attacks from Scots raiders. One of the many architecturally interesting features of the priory is the Norman doorway, preserved throughout many desecrations, including those of King Henry VIII, and it is one of the finest examples of Norman architecture in England. Most coast-to-coast -coast walkers prefer to walk from west to east, from St. Bees to Robin Hood's Bay, for many good reasons and most agree that the Lake District is the most beautiful, exciting and challenging part of the walk. Then there are the soft hills and valleys of the Yorkshire Dales, also very lovely to behold. But many walkers say that it's the first sight of the North Sea in the distance, many miles later, viewed from an upland expanse of heather that could be considered the greatest moment of the whole trip. This marks the beginning of the Coast to Coast Walk, a long distance walk devised by Alfred Wainwright about 40 years ago, to which people from all over the world come to walk 200 miles over three national parks of a very rough terrain, dales, mountains, fells, valleys, and eventually they'll reach Robin Hood's Bay on the North Sea coast of Yorkshire. I'm going to be accompanied on this trip by two old friends from Switzerland, Basil Riesco and Mariano Ries. So, with the aid of my trusty GPS, which is cheating a little bit, and the map, we hope to get to Robin Hood's Bay very soon. Come and join us on the Coast to Coast Walk, or the longest pub crawl in the world. The Great Walk is begun by climbing up St. Bees Headland, which is a mirror image of Robin Hood's Bay on England's opposite coast. 
Shortly after leaving the village, the first notable landmark is the cleft of Bessick Bay, the last chance to dip one's feet in the Irish Sea. The Lake District is considered to be the most strenuous part of the hike, so why not get that out of the way early on in one's walk, before the blisters are formed and exhaustion sets in. Also, if there is bad weather, which seems unavoidable in this part of the world, by travelling east it keeps the wind and the rain at one's back, because the weather here usually comes from the west. The walk from St. Bees to Cletor, our chosen first stop, we found to be the easiest of walks, with the highest climb only 100 metres. The mile zero post we had passed marked the starting point of the walk, facing the Irish Sea. St. Bees Head, with its tacky caravan park, is a broad expanse of secluded beaches and red sandstone cliffsides that drop 90 metres into the sea. There are many items that are helpful when making this walk. These include a guidebook, a set of tough waterproof polyethylene maps, and for the technically inclined walker, there is the GPS with waypoints to keep one on track. And for the more leisurely walker, a set of binoculars may come in handy, for there are always things to look at more closely. Wainwright has also cleverly given the adventurer a number of options, whereby, on occasion, there are various pathways to choose from, with different degrees of difficulty. The easier path, the moderate path, and the difficult pathway. But let me assure you that even the easiest pathways are not always easy. This walk was devised by Alfred Wainwright to use only public pathways, so that no trespassing on private lands is involved. The trail is primarily unmarked, the ground is often loose under one's footing, and when there is absolutely no other alternative way forward, some of the trek is made on roadways, sometimes with heavy lorries and other traffic zooming past. When approaching Cletor, the sea and screaming gulls are left behind. The meadows and pasture lands are dotted with sheep and cattle. The air is filled with the trill of birds, and one already begins to feel away from the bustle of the world. The five-mile stretch from Cletor to Ennerdale Bridge includes the 300-metre-long, sweaty climb up Dent Hill. The heavily forested conifer plantation lies on both sides of the permitted pathway through the forestry plantation. The first of many hundreds of miles of stone walls is followed. The wet pathway is slippery and one has to be aware of every footstep as they lead us to the first stile that must be crossed. This one was done with some difficulty. Maybe there is a special knack to it? If you're younger, it's no problem. Dent Hill, once a deer park, offers an extensive panorama of the Lakeland Fells ahead, the sea behind, the coastal plain of Cumbria, a scattering of villages and towns, including the fishing port of Whitehaven, and the nuclear power station of Sellafield at Seascale. In the distance, and on a clear day, one can see the Isle of Man, Northern Ireland, and the lowlands of southern Scotland. From this viewpoint, it makes one feel as if we're on top of the world. There are various ways in which to undertake this great walk. 
Some walkers carry all their basic needs on their backs, including tent, sleeping gear, cooking utensils and food, camping along the way. Local hikers make day walks, accompanied by a driver to pick them up at prearranged spots, then sleep back home in their own beds. Others, like us, have prearranged a self-guided holiday package, tailor-made to suit our needs, through one of the many guiding companies. Northwest Walks, just one of several companies, booked our lodgings, scheduled our luggage pickups each morning, and had it at our next destination by the time that we arrived there later that day. It worked seamlessly and is to be recommended, for it meant that all we had to carry was a small day pack with water bottle and sandwiches. After crossing an expanse of meadows and more stiles, we found ourselves at Raven Crag, and, hidden away at its foot, the Nanny Catch Beck trickling along, increasing in size as it's joined by two other becks or streams. Let me add that walking poles would have been a very useful thing to have when descending this very steep slope, so don't forget to add them to your list of things to bring along. The valley path is nestled in a deep ravine, winding along the picturesque beck hidden among the sylvan glades, before leading us to Ennerdale Bridge. It is also a favourite with local discerning walkers, who also seek solitude and a great place to exercise their dogs. Walking the long, rolling hills and pasture land was the perfect way to end this day and to prepare us for the mountainous lakeland ahead. It wasn't a long or a hard day, but nevertheless it felt wonderful to reach Ennerdale Bridge and our lodgings at the Shepherd's Arms Hotel and Pub. And by the stack of luggage, it appeared that we weren't the only coast-to-coast -coast walkers staying there. Ennerdale Bridge to Stonethwaite is a 15-mile, very strenuous walk past Black Sail Youth Hostel. It's over 18 miles if one takes the much harder detour path over Haystacks, the name of the mountain which was a favourite of Wainwright's. Leaving Ennerdale Bridge, and as we approached Ennerdale Water, a long stone wall was the landmark to the first of many forks in the road, where one has the option of walking along the easy road to the north side of Ennerdale Water, or along the more rugged southern shoreline, Wainwright's recommended route. Since this was only our third day of walking, and we were still fairly fresh, we followed in Wainwright's footsteps. Thin, spindly forest lay to our right, a reforestation scheme gone mad, the trees closely packed, depriving the undergrowth of light. Then, within minutes, we began to feel the grandeur of the Lake District. Craggy outcrops and vertical rock pillars decorate the shoreline. Halfway along the southern shoreline is the rocky outcrop called Robin Hood's Chair. Whether Robin Hood ever sat in it is debatable. Beyond Ennerdale Water and the Ennerdale Forest, the easier of two trails is directly ahead. The Black Sail Youth Hostel offers a respite for the weary traveller in bad weather. One can also walk up the steep mountain slope that leads to haystacks with a view of Buttermere that was one of Wainwright's favourites. Stumbling along the loose pathway, it was hard not to think of the legendary fell walker Wainwright and his passion for walking. Wainwright was of humble beginnings, his father a stonemason and an alcoholic. But, considering that, he did very well in school and was an accredited walker even as a child, walking up to 20 miles at a time. In 1930, at the age of 23, he climbed Orest Head in the Lake District and his lifelong love for that area was begun. The following year, he married Ruth Holden and a son, Peter, was born. In 1967, he and Ruth divorced and in 1970, he married Betty McNally, who became his walking companion thereafter. 
Wainwright died at aged 84 in 1991. A wealthy man, but he failed to leave anything to his son Peter, preferring to leave much of his wealth to animal charities. In 1966, Wainwright had written, All I ask for at the end is a long-lasting resting place by the side of innominate tarn on haystacks, where the water gently laps the gravelly shore and the heather blooms, and pillar and gable rocks keep unfailing watch. A quiet place, a lonely place. I shall go to it for the last time and be carried there by someone who knew me in life. They'll take me and empty me out of the little box and leave me there all alone. And if you, dear reader, should get a bit of grit in your boot as you're crossing haystacks in the years to come, please treat it with respect. It might be me. Betty, bless her heart, two months after Wainwright's death, carried his urn of ashes to the top of haystacks and scattered them over his beloved innominate tarn, just down from the top of haystacks. Stonethwaite to Grasmere is a moderate nine-mile walk that begins with a level amble through fields and along Stonethwaite Beck before scrambling up the unmarked trail that leads from Eagle Crag through the Greenup Gill to Greenup Edge. Alfred Wainwright loved this lake country, and his deep felt affection is so patently contagious that he has drawn countless other walkers keen to savour the unique landscape and to follow in his footsteps. He chose this coast-to-coast -coast route with a number of factors in mind. It was known to him, he was able to make a definite start and finish point, and, most importantly, nowhere along this line was there any industrial blemish. This quintessential English walking excursion is located in some of the most fragile environments on earth, but walking is still considered one of the most environmentally friendly approaches to tourism. However, it too has taken its toll on the environment of this region, leading to erosion of some of the trails. But it has also led to increased tourism and some increased prosperity here, in an area that fell into a severe depression between the two world wars, with the decline of coal and iron mining. It, like everything in this world, has its trade-offs. Not unlike the necessity of tired, sore feet as the price to pay to enjoy such a beautiful place. The route between Stonethwaite and Grasmere has a series of landmarks, passes, cairns, waterfalls, crags, pikes, tarns, gills and helms, all terms describing the deep valleys and streams. When leaving Stonethwaite, along Stonethwaite Beck, Eagle Crag looms in the distance until one is nearer, when suddenly the 700 metres peak of Grenop Edge crowns the horizon. It is a struggle to scramble up the mountain. The trail, if ever there was one, is hidden under the shifting stones and boulders. Wainwright's words suddenly come to mind. Surely there is no other place in this whole wonderful world quite like Lakeland, no other so exquisitely lovely. No other so charming, no other that calls so insistently across a gulf of distance. All who truly love Lakeland are exiles when they're away from it. Beyond Eagle Crag, the gradient rises again to a bare and shelterless crossing, before dropping into a basin of drumlins formed from glacial action and into the descent to Withburn Valley. From here, one can take one of the alternate routes, either the significantly more demanding high route or the valley walk, which is a narrow sheep path of loose pebbles where the Easdale Beck follows first to the right of one's walk and then to the left, seemingly there to guide one's way on to Poet's Walk and into Grasmere, where visitors come by the thousands. 
Grasmere, though lovely, is no longer a haven of peace and tranquillity in the high summer months. The Silver Lee Guest House is a welcome sight to us four weary travellers. Bliss! William Wordsworth called this valley the fairest place on earth, and I think he got it just about right. Grasmere, the village, has since been so popularised by his association with it that the hustle and bustle that surrounds the actual village has one eager to get back out onto the hills and dales after a short rest stop. The most popular tourist sites are St Oswald's Church and Dove Cottage, William Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy, also a poet, lived in Dove Cottage for nine years, along with his wife Mary and three children, and it was where he created some of his best-known works. Dove Cottage was later sold to the famous, or infamous, Thomas de Quincey, who wrote the book Confessions of an Opium Eater. The River Rothay winds its way through the village, feeding into Grasmere Lake, Across the lake, the meadows are full of sheep, and thick forests cover the hillsides. Yet, at every turn, one is reminded of Wordsworth and the great works that changed the history of English poetry. Wordsworth, with the aid of his close friend Coleridge, launched the style of poetry later called Romanticism, which allowed the writer to express his innermost feelings and not merely write about the material world. It is evident here in this poem, possibly his most famous, that he wrote for his sister Dorothy. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Grasmere to Patterdale is a short ten-mile walk, but no less sweet, for there are breathtakingly beautiful views of Grasmere from the top of the climb before crossing over the pass to take in the sublime views across Grisdale to Patterdale. Ullswater twinkles in the distance. But always be aware that regardless of your route, sometimes you have to share the road. Quite often, travellers do the coast-to-coast -coast walk in two segments, the first or west section from St Bees to Kirby Stephen, and the second or east section from Kirby Stephen to Robin Hood's Bay. In this segment, the first, we are in the modern county of Cumbria, which is an amalgamation of two ancient counties, Cumberland and Westmoreland, an amalgamation that took place in 1974. When walking Cumbria's backcountry and Lake District's National Park, one should try to imagine a history characterised by invasions, migrations and conquests, as well as constant skirmishing between the English and Scottish. In addition, for generations, this area of natural beauty has served as an inspiration for artists, writers and musicians, as well as over 15 million tourists each year. Cumbria's county motto in Latin is Ad Montes Oculos Levavi, 
I shall lift up mine eyes unto the hills. And it is impossible to avoid doing just that. After leaving the roadway, the bridleway divides into two paths. One is to Great Tungill, the steeper route, and the other to Little Tungill. This hike from Grasmere to Patterdale is at the very heart of the Lake District, and the scenery is at its most rugged. For me, the sweetest part of this whole trip was this strenuous climb out of Grasmere, up and up, as if never-ending. We took the easier Little Tungill route, and the wonderful weather made it easy to stop frequently to take it all in, making one recall the poem of the Welsh poet William Henry Davis. What is this life if, full of care, we have no time to stand and stare? No time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep or cows? No time to see when woods we pass, where squirrels hide their nuts in grass? No time to see, in broad daylight, streams full of stars like skies at night? No time to turn at beauty's glance and watch her feet how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can enrich that smile her eyes began. A poor life this, if full of care, we have no time to stand and stare. At the end of the steep climb, the two paths meet again at the pretty but black-looking mountain lake Grisdale Tarn, with the heights of Dollywagon Pike ahead. At Grisdale Tarn is another fork in the pathway. The left walk takes one over Helvellyn and Striding Edge, the hardest route. Its path can be seen zigzagging up its barren breast, a walk 900 metres up a steep mountainside that Wainwright waxed lyrical about, describing the notorious striding edge as the best quarter mile between St. Bees and Robin Hood's Bay. To the right is the Cape, or St. Sunday Crag route, only an 800 metres climb, which is considered the most satisfying. Directly down the centre lies Grisdale Valley route, the least challenging, a mere 600 metre climb, and where we are heading. St Sunday Crag slopes steeply to our right, and Striding Edge towers to our left. Not far along the trail is said to be a large rock, where Wordsworth, in 1800, left his brother John on the path one day and, after saying goodbye, never saw him again, for John died at sea a few years later. When descending the rocky trail of the steep mountain slope, one has to be ever aware of the loose stones underfoot. As you can see, I have put the walking stick to good use. Then, suddenly, we are surrounded by meadows filled with sheep, old stone walls, the sounds of Ruthwaite Beck as it babbles along, and in no time at all we are in Patterdale, a meandering collection of houses stretching along the highway. The valley is a wildlife haven to red squirrels and badgers, some of the last remaining in England. Yes, it was a short, memorable walk, but a lovely dinner at Old Waterview B&B &B was the perfect way to end the day. Ahead of us is a strenuous 16-mile walk. It was difficult to resist staying another night at such a comfortable B&B, &B, but one had to get on not only because Bampton Grange awaits our arrival, but also because, as scheduled, our luggage will be collected very soon and transported to the Crown and Mitre Inn at Bampton Grange. But emotionally, the hardest of all will be our leaving the Lake District behind. We will say goodbye to the crags, knots, pikes and fells, but it will not be done without a struggle. 
we will have to make a climb of 600 metres to Kidsty Pike before beginning the gnarling descent down the other side and to trudge along the undulating rocky footpath beside Horsewater. Before the day's end, our climb will add up to well over 1,300 metres. As we leave Patterdale, Ullswater can be seen behind us and Angle Tarn in the distance to the east. The views are superb and regardless of the direction, it is a wonderful sight to see. Halfway up Kidsty Pike, we paused to view the broad expanse of rolling uplands, the wide, far-reaching moors still to be crossed, bare and seemingly inhospitable. Behind us, the distinct peaks shaping the lofty skyline of the country we had just walked through. And far below were deep valleys formed millions of years ago. Kitsty Pike, the highest point on the walk at 748 metres, has a historical side to it, for on the uppermost rocks on Kitsty Pike, Romans sat 2,000 years ago, guarding the landscape for their legions marched across this land for hundreds of years. This walk also offers views of half-wild fell ponies, red deer and a variety of golden eagle, a few of which survive here alone. It is difficult to know where one should look first, for the views are magnificent. Ennerdale Water to the west, Scarfell Pike, Helvellyn, St Sunday's Crag, and to the south, the deep cleft of Riggingdale. In 1929, the great city of Manchester needed a new water reservoir. At that time, the Hawes Water Reservoir was a controversial project because it involved the flooding of a beautiful valley and the submersion of two picturesque villages, including Mardale Green, which is now deep below the waters. The village can still be seen at times of drought, situated close to the small wooded island that sits in the reservoir not far from the end of the lake near the pier. Gone, along with the villages of Meesand and Mardale Green, are the ancient village church and the centuries-old Dunbull Inn. Alfred Wainwright wrote, if we can accept as absolutely necessary the conversion of Horsewater, then it must be conceded that Manchester has done the job as unobtrusively as possible. Mardale is still a noble valley, but man works with such clumsy hands. Gone forever are the quiet wooded bays and shingle shores that nature had fashioned so sweetly in the Horsewater of old. How aggressively ugly is the tide mark of the new Horsewater. For those of us who never saw the lovely old villages of Meesand and Mardale Green, it is easy to look upon the large reservoir and wildlife haven as one of great beauty. Now for the steepest descent on the walk, 500 metres in one and a half miles before we reach Horsewater Reservoir and the four mile annoyingly steep up and down stumble along the west side of the lake. After that, another three miles along the hard, hard asphalt of the road to the Crown and Mitre Inn at Bampton Grange. With the Lake District National Park behind us, the landscape has taken on a softer look. We are now approaching the edge of the Yorkshire Dales, often referred to simply as the Dales. This area has a long history of cattle and sheep farming, with many exotic breeds of sheep to be seen. And let's not forget about the wonderful cheeses made in this part of the world. We find that roadways are very hard on the feet, and I'm sure that Wainwright felt the same way. But there are times when public access is not available across farmers' fields. Gone is the soft underfoot of the grassy pathways, as mile after mile we trudge along at the edge of the road while cars zip past. It was a relief to reach Shap, 
for within minutes we would once again escape onto the public footpaths and bridleways across meadows and stiles. With no prolonged gradients to climb, we viewed this as a rest day. Rolling hills shape the skyline as we make our steady, undulating transit over the fields. This area abounds with prehistoric sites of man's activities long ago. We were captivated by the clear blue sky, the lush green rolling hills, and the first of many rock-formed styles. And, as lovely as the view is, there is little time to dawdle, though we did do just that as often as possible. We can hear the sound in the distance of traffic as it whizzes along the M6 motorway. We were happy to see the overhead footbridge by which we could safely cross the busy motorway between England and Scotland. The motorways are the English equivalents of the interstates, the autobahns and autostrada in other parts of the world. Then, very soon, the sounds of the motorway were forgotten and drowned out by the bleating of sheep as we climbed the hills and moorlands before walking alongside a large quarry where again noise was loud and intrusive for a few minutes. Suddenly, it was quiet again as we passed by the tiny secluded village of Oddendale. It was so quiet here, in fact, that it seemed as if nobody lived there. Amid this fertile limestone plateau, ancient Britons lived for millennia, leaving behind evidence of their existence in burial mounds or barrows and stone circles. It is an interesting place for walkers, especially those with archaeological, antiquarian or historical interests. The flat stone plates that are scattered across the landscape here are actually the petrified remains of coral that indicate that this area was at the bottom of the sea millions of years ago. A short distance from the footpath is yet another of Robin Hood's many graves in England. We've counted at least five. We find it interesting that there are so many landmarks named after a man who possibly never existed, including Robin Hood's Bay, our final destination. If we had believed in this mythological man, we may have stopped from our route to take in the sight of the enormous mound of alleged burial rocks. Instead, we trudged on, taking in the many pleasant sights and sounds along our direct footpath to Orton. From this somewhat elevated position, we get a clear look at the Ravenstone Dale moors that lie beyond Orton. This stage of the coast-to-coast -coast walk, from near Shap to Orton, is a short eight miles, and though the countryside looks fairly bland and uninteresting, the low undulating hills abound with prehistoric and medieval ruins, though none of them are spectacular. If one looks closely at the places along the way, one can see the remains of old cottages, farmhouses, barns and inns. The approaches to Orton are soft and beautiful. Orton is one of those small communities along the way that are far from tourist routes, but survive with a little store, a pub or two, and a bus once a day to somewhere else. It's a great place to stay to avoid a long slog from Shap to Kirby Stephen. Our stay at the barn house was memorable. Orton to Kirby Stephen is a pleasant walk, 14 miles, an easy stride towards the long slope that leads down to Smardale Bridge, across to the other side, and up the opposite slope of the valley to the top of Smardale Fell. As we make our way over the pristine countryside, it is hard not to think of Wainwright again and wonder what he would think if he knew that, more than a decade after his death, interest in him, his designed walks and his publications have soared, showing little signs of abating. 
he had a characteristic way of describing mountains. He took a mountain, scaled it, calculated its length and width, made it more understandable by drawing and describing it, and by this means made it walkable. He once said, The hills are eternal. Always there will be the lonely ridge, the dancing beck, the silent forest. Always there will be the exhilaration of the summits. Even now, every so often, industry pushes for changes to be made to the landscape. Immediately following that potential threat, a journalist or concerned member of the public will pose the awkward question, what would Wainwright make of that? It's generally come to be known that Wainwright was difficult, grumpy, reclusive, and more than a little cynical, fonder of animals than he was of people. Wainwright's name hasn't always been so well thought of as it is today. He inadvertently became famous during his lifetime due to his passion for walking and through the books that he produced. In 1985, when his book sales approached one million copies, it led to one of his famously reclusive moments. A prize was organised to mark the millionth copy sold, whereby the purchaser would win a private dinner with Wainwright. He was so dismayed by the prospect of sitting down to dine with a perfect stranger that he bought the one millionth book himself. Long before the phrase low-carbon footprint had become popular, he often encouraged kindness to the environment by encouraging hill walkers, ramblers and mountaineers who gravitate to this coast-to-coast -coast walk to do it the right way, to think about what they were going to do. And he also believed that one should never do anything aimlessly, as in this statement of his. One should always have a definite objective in a walk as in life. It is so much more satisfying to reach a target by personal effort than to wander aimlessly. Life without ambition is, well, aimless wandering. After leaving the grandeur of the Lake District, and before we get into the splendour of the Yorkshire Dales, we find ourselves walking through this region, called appropriately the Eden Valley a place of rare natural beauty and a source of great inspiration to walkers, artists, writers and musicians. This quiet area of traditional towns and pubs, beautiful hamlets and sandstone villages, some dating back to Viking times, has remained unspoiled by industry. This whole region, quite extensive in area, surrounds the course of the River Eden, which arises in the Pennine Hills range nearby and runs northward to flow into the Solway Firth. The walking here is quiet and stress-free, no great climbs and descents, and always a soft landscape to look at. Every view is like a beautifully wrought painting. The pretty villages and countryside of the Eden Valley get largely overlooked by the tourists who throng to the tourist centres not far away. We had to follow the map very carefully through this part of the walk as there are many twists and turns along the dry stone walls and through the many detours around farmhouses and other private property. Smardale Bridge, which crosses the stream known as Smardale Gill, is of uncertain age. Beyond the bridge can be seen, if one looks very hard, the raised mounds called the Giant's Graves, again of great age, which were thought to have covered prehistoric pens for animals, or small buildings for storing grains or hay. From the lower slope of Crosby Garrett Fell, the splendid views of Kirby Stevens church spires and buildings can be seen on a clear day in the distance, spiking over the wooded vale. 
one can also see Malastang Edge, Wild Boar Fell, Haugil Fells, and the local boys who use the slopes for cycling. It has been a glorious eight days walk from St. Bees to Kirby Stephen. The Lake District could not have been sunnier and brighter, and our timing was perfect, for never once did we need to don our rain gear. In that time, we have climbed mountains to stand atop their highest point and gaze in wonder at the spectacular beauty around us. We later strolled along deep valleys and lake shores, pausing from time to time to soak up the splendour. Now we approach Kirby Stephen, and our coast-to-coast -coast walk through the Lake District will be a lasting memory. We look forward to walking into Yorkshire and the Dales. Kirby Stephen is often referred to as the halfway point along the walk, although more accurately that distinction should go to Keld. However, Kirby is a bigger village, it's on a main roadway and offers more amenities for walkers. It also has a railway station, the first since St. Bees, for those who leave the Coast to Coast Trail to pick it up again the following year. We have chosen this point of our walk to enjoy a couple of days rest and to reflect on what we have seen and experienced and to ponder what lies ahead. One of the most surprising things that we have discovered is that although roughly 2,000 people make the walk each year, we seldom had the opportunity to meet up with them along the way. On occasion, a few would speed past us along the trail, always appearing more energetic than ourselves, and only on one occasion did we meet walkers travelling the other way from east to west. The trail never seems crowded. Therefore, Kirby Stephen is the perfect place to take a moment to converse with a few of those who have been caught up in the Wainwright fever as we have. They come from around the world. We have met walkers from Australia, Germany, the USA and Canada like ourselves, and with them they bring the stories of other walks that they have completed. The Pennine Way, the Dolomites in Italy and the Inca Trail in Peru to name a few. So although taking a few days off from walking is not the Wainwright way, it adds a different flavour to the walk by hearing people's stories about why they are making the pilgrimage, where they have been, and what their future plans are. Plus, it also gives us a chance to take in the lovely old market town that tightly hugs a street that stretches no more than a mile, to walk through the ancient streets with shops and cafes, hotels and B&Bs enough to meet the needs of most coast-to-coast -coast walkers. It's also rewarding to visit the ancient church built in the year 1240 a Norman replacement for a wooden Saxon church. The old market in the middle of town has a charter dating back to the year 1352, when King Edward III gave a local nobleman permission to hold a market, held here regularly ever since. It's also noticeable, after arriving in Kirby Stephen, that signs indicating the coast-to-coast -coast walk start to appear. They are totally banned in the Lake District, though there were many occasions when they might have been reassuring. I find it no surprise that the Lake District was Wainwright's favourite, for it's difficult to find words that would adequately describe the exquisite beauty of that region, the exhilaration that one experiences as one stands atop the summits of the fells, and the peace that is felt with listening to the bird song and the bleating of sheep drifting over the hillsides. All of that glory is now behind us. We have completed the first half of the Coast to Coast Walk, and we take a well-deserved rest in Kirby Stephen before following on in Wainwright's footsteps. 
we leave here to stride across the rolling hills and valleys of the Yorkshire Dales. We'll cross the Cleveland Hills and the North Yorkshire Moors to arrive at our final destination, Robin Hood's Bay. We're well equipped with good footwear, light rain gear, a walking stick, Wainwright's guidebook in hand, a set of ordnance survey maps, and the trusty GPS. <laughs>